Hi everyone, and welcome to this very special episode of Girls Inspires Podcast. It is a political segment where Natasha will be speaking with the former Chief Chief of Staff in Prime Minister Morgan Swankarai's office, former advisor to Zimbabwe's constitution making team. He's the writer of Big Saturday Read. Enjoy the segment with Alex Magaisa. Um, hi, Alex. Oh, hi, hi. How are you, Natasha? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining me. And um, how are you? How has lockdown been? Uh, lockdown has been testing, uh, but we are we are hanging in there. We are surviving, which is the most important thing. And yeah. I hope you you're doing good as well. Yes, yes, I am. And how's everyone in Zim? How's the family in Zim? Are they fine? Well, Zim seems to be doing all right. Except, you know, as far as uh, uh, you know, people are concerned, they are hearing it from here. They yeah. they have no idea uh, what's going on. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I think that um, I, I hope that I hope to God, I pray to God that things will be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you so much. So what I wanted us to do today is really just have a conversation because um, we know that there's been a lot of things that have been happening in Zimbabwe, um, you know, decisions being made by the courts, uh, things happening in the opposition and some really worrying reports that we're hearing. So I wanted us to take this time, you know, to get your, to pick your brains, um, you know, to understand what the current state of play is, have an opportunity to perhaps look back um, at how we've got to where we are and talk about the future. So to start off with, um, I, you know, I read your recent BSR, um, Big Saturday Read, uh, for those who don't know, um, and you talked about, and I found the recent articles very interesting, where you've talked about the Constitution, you talked about the courts, um, and the issue with the opposition. So if you could just explain to us what is happening right now. Well, um, you know, first of all, thanks for reading the Big Saturday Read, uh, the BSR, <laughs> as, as we call it um it's a uh, it's a labor of love it's something that i do because i hope that it it it, it encourages public discourse mm -hmm. um you know that that we demystify politics we demystify the law and um the the writings that i've been you know having over the last few weeks have focused a lot on um, the decisions of the courts mm -hmm. uh, in particular in co concerning the opposition party, uh, the MDC, or the different MDCs, so to speak. Um, but also I've been focusing on how the courts have dealt with uh, wider national constitutional issues where I think that the courts could, could do better. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll put it very politely yes. and say that they could, they could do much better than they've shown in, in, in the last few decisions. So, um, as to what is going on in Zimbabwean opposition politics, um, well, you know, I think that um, things are not what they should be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that even the practitioners in, in opposition politics will agree that they could handle things better than they have done in the last few, few years. And what we are seeing now is a culmination of all those uh, conflicts, all those challenges, uh, the irregularities, and uh, like I say, the conflicts that have been taking place uh, in the opposition. Now, this is not new uh, by any means. We go back to the very early years of the MDC. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, the first difficult patch was in 2005 when yeah. there was a split in the party. And then uh, we also had challenges uh, later on, especially in 2014, um, and uh, more recently, as we see, or more currently, mm. we are seeing these challenges in the opposition. Um, one of our great political scientists, um, Professor Masipula Sitole, may you so rest in peace, mm. uh, once wrote a book, a fascinating book, about the liberation struggle, called Struggles Within the Struggle. Mm. Uh, the book was essentially uh, an analysis, an examination of the challenges that were taking place within the liberation movement, in particular in ZANU, uh, uh, ZANLA, the struggles that were taking place then. Um, 
and and I see a, a similar um, perhaps title as far as the MDC is concerned that there have also been uh, struggles within the struggle. They are not necessarily the same. They are not. Uh, uh, they don't mimic the struggles of the liberation war, but they they are struggles within the MDC. And whenever you bring a group of people who have different ideas, whenever you have leaders who have different views and different uh, perspectives on how things should be done, you are always going to have this conflict. And, and I think that the most important thing for, for the leaders is to learn how to manage conflict. Mm. And I think that conflict management is a skill that perhaps is uh, in rather short supply in our political environment. Uh, there is no acceptance that a person can have a different view and still remain a member of the party, you know. Um, and there is no acceptance also on the part of those who differ, that you can differ with the leadership, you can differ with the party, without necessarily deciding that you walk away and form your own party or create your own outfit. Um, we see this, uh, we have been fortunate enough to live in other countries where we see how politics is played. And um, we have seen that uh, leaders do differ on very fundamental issues, mm -hmm. but uh, they eschew their differences and they learn to live with each other, accommodating each other. Uh, on occasions, of course, one or two might decide to leave and uh, form their own party, but you find that the political parties tend to have stability and durability. And I think that uh, what we have seen in the MDC over the past 20 years is a test of the opposition party. Uh, and the fact that it has endured for 20 years is no mean feat. Uh, if you do it by comparison, um, ZAPU and ZANU were formed in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. It took them uh, less than 20 years to achieve their objective, which was to gain political power. Mm -hmm. And uh, the MDC was formed in 1999. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's 21 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And um, it hasn't achieved its objective of winning political power. And naturally, within that long period of time, you are going to have people who get tired, fatigued. Mm -hmm. You are going to have people who uh, see things differently in terms of you know what, you've been here for so long, but you are failing. I think we saw that in 2014 when some of the comrades in the MDC mm. thought that it was time up for Morgan Trangirai and that it was in a time to, to hand over the baton. Uh, yeah. Now, you know, that resulted in a split. Um, and of course, the lack of succession management in the MDC was also then a cause for what we now have, yeah. uh, which is a uh, 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 all these things that I'm seeing right now with the courts intervening and different fractions of the party making claims, different leaders making claims, this is all part of a failed uh, succession management system. Mm -hmm. It was never in place. And if it had been in place, I think that we could have avoided a lot of the challenges that we are, we are having now. Yeah. So thank you for that. So I guess my follow up question is in two parts, which is one looking at the future. So, well, one looking at the present, which is what is Chamisa's position now and what is his way forward? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'd like to pick up on the point that you made about 2005, because I think it's really important to sort mm -hmm. of like go back and interrogate mm -hmm. that further. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you know, um, we all know, or perhaps just to give a brief history of, mm -hmm. of the case that yeah. has prompted what we have right now. Um, in 2016, Morgan Shangirai, um, when he was uh, diagnosed with cancer, um, he then decided to appoint two new vice presidents. Mm -hmm. uh, that was Nelson Chamisa and Elias Mudzuri uh, to become co-deputy presidents with uh, Dr. Tokozani Kupe, who was the elected uh, deputy president. And, and that was a, a very difficult moment uh, because it, it did not seem uh, to be the, the right thing to do. And I myself um, uh, raised my concerns over the move that, that was taken at the time for a number of reasons. Uh, I thought that, um, I thought that uh, the, 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 the process uh, was, was not the, the right 
process at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the MDC say that they had um, uh, done it according to the constitution. They say that they had uh, followed uh, the constitution, the National Council had set and given powers to the president and so forth. Uh, I mean, in the end, uh, the decision passed and none of the leaders <laughs> at the time uh, openly challenged what had happened. They all seemed to to accept uh, what had happened. So, you know, you, you can't moan more than the bereaved. So those of us who were raising uh, concerns over this issue mm -hmm. thought that uh, if those who are aggrieved by it are accepting it, then why should they be, why should anybody else be intervening and crying on their behalf? And there was a, a Are case. you referring to Dr. Togozani Kupe? Yes, Dr. Togozan Kupe, yes. I thought that she had uh, every right to challenge what had happened at the time, uh, but she didn't. Um, I think that she chose to challenge it by her conduct. Uh, so essentially she decided to start withdrawing uh, from some of the activities. Uh, and one could understand why she was taking that approach because she was yeah. obviously an aggrieved party. But I think that she realized that it was suicidal for her and anybody else to challenge uh, Morgan Jagrai, who was held in such high regard by the MDC supporters. But at the same time, I think her conduct uh, did leave a lot to be desired because she wasn't attending some of the meetings that was being held uh, at the party headquarters and so forth. And indeed, uh, the party could have moved in terms of the constitution to, to you know, um, challenge her position. But again, the party seemed to also accept the, the potential illegalities. So there were a lot of things that were taking place at that time. I, I think that perhaps you could say it's forbearance. You know, you, you exercise forbearance. Sometimes you say, um, I have the power to do something, but I'm not going to use that power because it's not politically uh, uh, practical uh, or it's not politically wise to use that power. So maybe that's what both parties did. Um, but, but nevertheless, <laughs> we, we went on and then, of course, the founding president, Shangri, passed on in uh, February 2018. Mm -hmm. And at the time that he passed on, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty as to how the succession was going to be handled because nothing had been done to handle it. And uh, that's when uh, uh, Advocate Chamisa moved in uh, and was able to um, you know, get into power in a manner that uh, obviously was quite controversial. And uh, uh, again, I, myself, and a few others did uh, raise questions about what needed to be done in that, in that process. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, th there was uh, an election which was imminent. Uh, the party seemed to rally behind uh, Nelson Chamisa, and uh, he became the, the acting president. Now, um, I, I thought that uh, at that time, even though there were misgivings over some of the irregularities, the party had made its decision and the party had decided to follow a, a particular route. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, like I said, you can't moan more than the bereaved. Now, what I saw at that time was that Dr. Cooper decided to, to move away and uh, uh, you know, take that step of creating her own party, so she had her own MDCT. Now, you might say she didn't create a party because in her view, she was simply continuing as yeah, a legitimate that's leader say, yes, yeah. of, of the MDCT. And, and that's in, in definitely what she did. And um, she had a Congress in April 2018 where she was confirmed as the uh, president to finish uh, President Shangri's term. Mm -hmm. There were new, uh, or the new executive. And indeed, they went on to contest an election in that, in that, uh, in that mode while the MDC Alliance uh, uh, went on to contest elections with uh, Chamisa as its head. Now, 2019, <laughs> President Nelson Chamisa, then uh, uh, there was then a Congress uh, of the MDC Alliance, which then brought together all these different uh, players, uh, Professor Walsh Mengube, Chendai mm -hmm. uh, and other players who had previously not been part of the MDC, uh, but were still part of the MD, broader MDC family, yeah. came together. And then, uh, so, so if you ask me, what is Chamisa now? 
-hmm. Well, he, he is, and I think his supporters will tell you that he is the president of the MDC Alliance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, I think that there is a lot of challenges at the moment in terms of uh, assertion of rights over the MPs in parliament. Mm -hmm. We have seen a parliament making a decision which is seemingly uh, against uh, Nelson Chamisa and the MDC Alliance. Uh, but at the same time, we're having challenges from the Nelson Chamisa group regarding the action that was taken by the speaker. Uh, I've written about the recall of MPs. Mm -hmm. I think that um, whatever the politics between the different players, mm -hmm. my own view is that the speaker and the president of the Senate uh, jumped the gun. They did not have to make the decision that they made because they did not have the power to do so. They did not have the full facts upon which to resolve what is a patently a hazy and, and difficult situation. I think they should have uh, deferred and, and left it to the parties to resolve their issues through the courts as they are now doing. Mm. So uh, is the court the next step? Is that the only viable option that Chamisa has? You know, yeah, what, what, what are his options? Well, um, you know, of course, they're, they're taking their, their matter to court. I think they've, they've the four MPs have challenged their expulsion uh, from the parliament, and they are doing so, if I understand the case correctly, mm -hmm. by challenging the manner in which they were uh, expelled from the from the party <laughs> now um which party exactly you see but uh, but uh, i am assuming that they are, they are saying that even from the mdc t party which mm -hmm. is supposedly led by dr Coupe, mm -hmm. they, they are arguing that they were they were dismissed illegally now if you if you think about it uh, that party did not hold any meeting it did not hold any meeting of the national council the national executive or even the standing committee, which is like the executive committee of the party. I think that one or two people sat together and decided that uh, they didn't like certain individuals or they should make an example out of them. And so they picked four people out of all the different MPs who they are claiming and decided to set. I think that it was petty. I think it was vindictive. I think that it was bad politics. Um, because what it does is that it completely uh, cuts off uh, any potential for creating a bridge when you take such a drastic step. And I, I myself have always argued that even though parties have this power to expel MPs, they should really not, not do that unless it's absolutely necessary and they've got the mandate of the people. Because the people who vote for these MPs have no say whatsoever in the decision that the party makes to either keep or expel the MPs. And what we have just seen is yet another instance, as we have seen with others, where a, a group of people decide that they want to use uh, the power that they have or the power that is available under the constitution to sack uh, an MP and they do so in a manner that is very vindictive. And I think it's bad politics. It, mm -hmm. it leads to polarization. It leads to all the kind of conflicts that we have today where you weaponize the law in order to achieve a political objective. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned 2005. Um, so that's where you mentioned that being the first irregularity from MDC. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts, uh, or in hindsight, do you think um, Morgan Tangari was, was wrong to walk away and essentially create his own MDC um, when he didn't get the vote from the National Council? You know, did you think he was wrong? Well, you know, uh, politically, his supporters will say he did the right thing because the MDC that he led continued to be the core MDC around which every other MDC which uh, went uh, separate ways eventually coalesced. Now, was it the right thing to do? I, I think that uh, even then, you know, I, I think that it wasn't the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, when you are dealing with legal issues um, and when you decide to follow uh, processes within a political organization, 
I think it's very important to use those political processes and to follow those political processes because otherwise at the end of the day you create a situation which is kind of like the wild west where anything goes if you don't get your way then you use the power of you know the 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 might and we have seen this with zanu pf we have seen this with uh, the what is wrong with our politics at national level where zanu pf decides that uh, it will use force uh, if it can't get its way. So, so I think the 2005 situation could have been handled in a different way. I mean, if you think about it at the end of the day, the MDC ended up participating in the Senate elections uh, yeah. over the last <laughs> few years, or rather 15 years, uh, the MDC has been a, an integral part of the Senate. Mm. So, I think that the decision that was taken by the MDC at that time, you know, was not the correct decision because it was based on a very short term view of what needed to be done, which was to simply oppose what Zanu PF was doing. I didn't agree with the return of the Senate because I thought that, um, and I still think that the Senate uh, can be a waste of time in terms of money as well. Uh, I think it's, uh, it, it can be a waste. Our parliament is too big anyway, you know. Yeah. Even if we have a second chamber, I think we, we need to have a, a, a much smaller chamber than, than we have. But even though I did not agree with the Senate, if the National Council had voted in favor of participating in the Senate, then I think it's a no-brainer. The party should simply have followed what, what it had agreed. So, so uh, hindsight is always a good thing. But... Yeah. but uh, I think even at the time, uh, the foresight would have told people that the right thing to do was to follow the decision of the body that had, that had uh, the mandate or the power to do so. Yeah. And yeah. just picking up on the point of the Senate and, you know, the function that it's played. Um, so I just wanted to talk about your latest um, Big Saturday read where you talk about the Constitutional Court, uh, the Constitutional Amendment and what's happening now. Um, if you could, you know, share with our listeners who may not be familiar with what's happening with that. And I thought your, your take was really interesting about um, the court uh, agreeing that, a, what was it, that a cow should be given and, and yet giving a goat. But um, <laughs> if, if you could uh, share. Okay. okay, I'll try to be brief. It's a very fascinating case. Um, so uh, in um, in... Uh, 2017, or rather to go back to 2016, uh, it was almost time for Chief Justice Shijo Siku, who was the uh, head of the judiciary, to retire because he was reaching 70 years in 2017. Uh, so he started making preparations through the Judicial Services Commission, which is the body that has the power to uh, conduct interviews for judicial aspirants. So in that case, the vacancy was almost due. And so they started uh, looking, inviting people to apply to become the new chief justice. Mm. Now, they were following the process. This process is provided for in section 180 of our constitution. Mm. Now, some people in zanu uh, did not like this process. Uh, they wanted the president to have exclusive power to appoint the chief justice. Uh, in fact, that was the position for a long time before the 2013 constitution. Uh, the president could appoint whoever he wanted uh, in consultation or after consultation with the Judicial Services Commission. Now, just to explain what this means, when you consult someone, mm -hmm. you don't have to follow what they say. You can, you know, I can say I want Natasha to be the next chief justice, mm -hmm. and I might consult Zimbabwean, now, if Zimbabweans say we want uh, uh, John or, or Mary to become the Chief Justice, um, I don't have to listen to them. I simply tick the box and I say I consulted them. Mm -hmm. They told me they want John and Mary, but I really don't care. I will just go ahead and appoint Natasha. So, so this is why I say it's an exclusive power <laughs> that the president has. Mm -hmm. So some people in Zanipia didn't like the new process which would have required the Judicial Services Commission to conduct public interviews and to select the best candidate. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they 
started to create an amendment to the constitution. So that's what we call amendment number one. And, but there was no amendment. So they tried to uh, stop the process that was already underway and they, they went to court. Uh, they didn't go to court themselves. They chose, uh, there's a metaphor that I like to use. A, a turtle is on a lamp post, you see. <laughs> is that, uh, is that uh, uh, when you see a turtle is on a lamp post, you know, a turtle cannot climb to the top of a lamp post. Yeah. So someone must have put it there. The problem is that the turtle has no idea what to do when it's on top of the lamp post. So yeah. anyway, they had a guy who, who, who uh, launched a legal uh, application to the high court mm -hmm. saying that the Judicial Services Commission should stop the process that they were undertaking uh, of selecting the new chief justice. The high court judge at the time uh, ruled in favor of this guy. And uh, that almost threw the whole process into disarray. Uh, however, the, the Judicial Services Commission appealed to the Supreme Court. And uh, when you make an appeal, it suspends the decision of the court from which you are appealing. And yeah. so that allowed uh, the Judicial Services Commission to go ahead and conduct interviews. And then of course, those interviews, everybody saw what happened, they were televised and Chief Justice Malaba, who is now the Chief Justice, uh, came out victorious. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we all like that process. I, as you know, I was part of the constitution making process. I like that process because it allows everything to be done in a transparent way. There is no way that the system could have cheated Chief Justice Malaba because everybody could see that he was the best performer on the day. And there's no way they could have appointed someone else whom they liked because the others had performed rather dismally in fact and the other one had completely dropped out of the rest so you know that is an example of why that process is the best process to have it's used in South Africa, in, in other countries uh including kenya uh, i think that south africa has a different variety but for most of these judges it also conducts a, a public interviews but anyway, that is what uh, that is what we were we were hoping we would have, and we had for Chief Justice Malala. Mm -hmm. Now, constitutional amendment number one was eventually passed in 2017, right. uh, but that was long after Chief Justice Malala had been appointed. Mm -hmm. So this would only affect the future Chief Justices. Now, uh, the problem is that when the when the process of enacting this law was conducted. There were some irregularities. And the irregularities were that uh, the vote in the Senate was not up to the threshold which is required. When you have a constitutional bill, it must be passed by two thirds majority of the National Assembly and by two thirds majority of the Senate. Yeah. The problem is that it wasn't passed by two thirds majority of the Senate. Two thirds majority of the Senate was 54 out of the 80 members, but only 53 members voted in favor of the bill. So it was irregular, right? Mm -hmm. So the question, uh, rather what happened was two MPs, uh, Innocent Gonese and Jesse Majome, she was still an MP at the time, uh, they then launched legal proceedings challenging the legality of constitutional amendment number one. Mm. <laughs> what they did was, and this is very important, uh, for purposes of understanding why the court is wrong in the way that it handled the matter. When they first went to court, they were challenging the bill. They were saying the constitutional bill has not been passed properly by parliament because it was not yet signed into law. It was still a bill before the president. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, the president went ahead, it was President Mugabe at the time, and he signed the bill into law. So Gonese and Majome had to change their application so that they were now challenging the legality of the act right. of the law which had been passed uh, by the legislature, which is parliament and the president. Mm -hmm. So when they went to court, they were no longer saying the bill is irregular. They were saying the act itself is unlawful. Now, unfortunately, the court agreed that the process that had been used to come up with this act was unlawful. The problem 
is that the court continued to treat the problem as a bill, right. not as a law. Mm -hmm. So uh, while, to use my metaphor, while Majome and Gonese were saying this is a cow, mm -hmm. the court was saying, yes, we agree there's a problem, but it's a, it's a goat. Right. You see? And mm -hmm. uh, uh, when they ruled in favor of uh, Majome and, and Gonese, uh, which was the right thing to do, they gave them what they were not asking for. They gave them a goat instead of the cow. Mm -hmm. uh, because what the court said is, okay, we agree that this is an improper bill, not an improper act. Uh, and we should now take it back to the Senate, mm -hmm. where the Senate can now conduct a new vote. Now, I've given reasons in my big salary read as to why this is completely wrong. It is wrong because the parliament which considered this bill ended in 2018 when parliament dissolved. Because every time that you have a new election, the old parliament dissolved. It's no longer there. And mm -hmm. in accordance with our constitution, everything that was before that parliament, including bills, they lapsed. When you say lapse, we mean they end, they come to an end, they no longer exist. Mm -hmm. So for the, for the court to say, this bill should now go back to the Senate, now to a new Senate of a new parliament, they're co completely breaching the constitution. They are doing something that is irregular, something that is illegal, because the current parliament cannot deal with the business of the previous parliament. What the court should have done, and, and, and this, in my opinion, is the correct legal position, mm. the court should have accepted what Majome and Gonese were saying, which is that the law is unlawful, or the law is, is invalid. And if the court had said the law is invalid, that would have been the end of the inquiry for the court. It's up to parliament what it does. Whether it wants to bring the bill again, they mm. have to start afresh. But I explained also, why the court did what it did. And this is where it gets interesting. Mm. The court was fully conscious of the consequences of declaring the act invalid. One of the most important acts that was done after the amendment number one was the appointment of Deputy Chief Justice Elizabeth Gwaunza to mm -hmm. become the, uh, yeah, the Deputy Chief Justice. What it means is that she was improperly and illegally appointed, that she is not uh, properly in that role. So the court had to save it uh, for, a, for a period of time. That's why they said, we are giving Senate 180 days to make this regular, mm -hmm. uh, because then it serves the position of the Deputy Chief Justice. And you might ask me, why does it matter? Well, it matters because the Deputy Chief Justice sat in many cases, including one of the very interesting cases, which is the election petition. She was also one of the judges there. Now, if we say that she was illegally appointed, it means that the court was also improperly constituted and therefore its decisions are subject to challenge. Mm -hmm. so, so the court is acting out of self-interest here, but I think it has been, and I say this with great respect, dishonest. I think in the way that it has handled this matter, mm -hmm. I think there are better ways in which they could have handled the illegality and the consequences of illegality. If you don't mind, Natasha, let me just give you another parallel situation. When the Supreme Court found that Nelson Chamisa had been uh, unlawfully appointed deputy mm -hmm. president, and that he had become president in an unlawful way. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the court said is that everything that he did in that capacity had become invalid. Right. Right? Now, now if we follow the logic of that in this constitutional case, mm. it means that if the deputy chief justice was invalidly appointed, to her role. It means that everything that she did in that role is also invalid. Now, the court was not prepared to do that. It didn't do that. Mm. Uh, it, it didn't do that. That's why the court then decided 
that the best way to resolve this political difficulty for it was to ask the Senate to reconsider the bill. But as I have already explained, mm. they are very wrong in asking this particular Senate to consider a bill which no longer exists because it lapsed at the end of the last parliament. Now, mm. they are going to bulldoze their way. We know what ZANU PF can do. But I should say that uh, for the Deputy Chief Justice and mm. the other judges who have been appointed in terms of that a particular uh, act, the amendment number one, mm -hmm. they will always throughout their careers be tainted by illegitimacy uh, on account of the fact that even if this amendment number one is passed in the way that the court wants it to be done, it mm -hmm. will still be illegal. That illegality cannot be cured by the way that the constitutional court has tried to do. So, so does this mean that our courts are compromised? Well, you know, I, I hate to say this, but the way that our courts have conducted themselves uh, in, in matters that have a political leaning, it leaves a lot to be desired. Mm. Let me draw a comparison. When uh, Chief Justice Chijuasiku decided to continue with the process of appointing the new Chief Justice with Chief Justice Malava. Mm -hmm. um, when the matter went to the Supreme Court, one of the judges, who is actually a judge of the current Supreme Court, Justice Patel, he issued a very important judgment, mm -hmm. which said the court and the Judicial Services Commission do not have the power to say well, we think that there is an amendment coming up, so we are not going to follow the constitution. They said, no, you follow the constitution as it exists. And that is why Chief Justice Shijigao Siku followed section 180 mm -hmm. to appoint Chief Justice Malaba. Mm -hmm. Now, in this particular situation, uh, the 22nd of May, was the date when there should have been a new constitutional court with new judges. They should have been appointed in accordance with section 180 of the constitution. In other words, there should have been interviews, there should have been nominations, and we should have had a new set of judges on the 22nd of May. Now, if Chief, Chief Justice Malaba and the Judicial Services Commission had done what his predecessor had done, which is to insist on the application of section 180, we would be having a new court. But you know what? They decided to not apply section 180. Mm. They decided to uh, wait. The reason is that they are waiting for a new constitutional amendment, constitutional amendment number two, right. which the government wants to put in place because they want to give the president more powers to promote uh, serving judges, current judges, to higher courts. Right. You see? So what the court has done here, or rather not the court, what the Chief Justice and the Judicial Services Commission have done is they have allowed themselves to uh, pander to the interests of the politicians who want to change the law so that they can have more powers to appoint judges of the Constitutional Court. My view is that this is quite a, di a disgrace. Mm. I think that the Chief Justice and the Judicial Services Commission should have done what Chief Justice Jigosiku did, which was to insist on applying Section 180 of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, Justice Patel, in that case that I have referred to, he said anybody which has duties and functions under the Constitution and fails to comply with those duties or functions, it will be in breach of the Constitution. Mm. In my view, the Chief Justice and the Judicial Services Commission are in breach of the Constitution because they have willfully neglected to apply Section 180 of the Constitution. What I would love to see mm. is uh, someone going to court, <laughs> going back to them and saying to them, 
you guys, you breached the law and you breached the law for one, two, three, four, five reasons. Now, I know that the court will dismiss this application and will give all manner of reasons for mm -hmm. dismissing it. But it's important that it be done for the record. Someone will have to challenge it. It's not enough for myself, for Magaisa, mm -hmm. writing from an academic point of view to point out why this is illegal, why this is wrong. I think it's important to throw it back into their court, so to speak, <laughs> literally, and say, you guys, you have uh, done kamikaze politics with uh, the constitution. This is not right. It, for me, it's disappointing because the constitutional court is supposed to be the upper guardian. It's supposed to be the gatekeeper of rights of the constitution. It's supposed to defend the constitution from politicians. Mm. What we are seeing right now is that the judiciary is acting in a manner that essentially compromises, that essentially distorts, manipulates, and corrodes the constitution and all the values that it stands for. It's mm. disappointing. As I said, it's a disgrace. And I am ashamed to see that uh, even uh, judges from other countries were involved. You know, they came to a ceremony on Friday the 22nd to preside over a process um, which really is improper. Mm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you talked about the constitution and you were part of the constitution making process. Uh, we're seven years into the new constitution um, that most will agree hasn't been aligned with our laws and rules. I wanted to get your thoughts on um, the, well, what, what you think needs to be done for the 2013 constitution to be effected, to be in place. Um, and will, will the, is there a need for further amendments? Because clearly um, it, it doesn't seem that the constitution seem, is working. Well, thank you. Um, you know, first of all, I should say it, it was quite an honor to be involved in the process. Um, it's, a, it's an historic process. And when you get involved in such, you realize the enormity of the responsibility mm -hmm. that you hold. And some of us were trying to do it not out of partisan reasons. You know, some of us, people know my, my political uh, uh, leanings. But, but they don't affect the way that I engage with the law, especially when it comes to constitution uh, making and law making. Essentially, I, I'd like to see the values that uh, we stand for being upheld as a nation. Now, it's disappointing that seven years afterwards, there is a lot that still hasn't been done. The latest example we have just seen, the failure to constitute the constitutional court in a proper way. Mm -hmm. um, we, they will say that, well, we have done it because we have got the power to appoint acting judges. But it's, it's ridiculous, it's silly to, to say that the highest court in the land is populated by five judges who are in the acting capacity. That is never what was intended by the framers of the Constitution. You know, it's, it's absolutely uh, disappointing to see that the highest court in the land would circumvent a clear provision, a clear provision, which requires them to conduct public interviews in order to select judges of the highest court in the land, and they just don't follow it. So that's one example. But there are many other examples in the constitution, too many to, to mention. I can talk about devolution, for example. Yes. We had devolution as one of the things that we thought would be very important, especially for communities that uh, were previously disadvantaged in the last 40 years, or at the time it was, what, uh, 33 years, we thought that it was important to, to have provisions that would allow for local politics to be conducted locally, for local development to be uh, uh, in the hands of local people who know what they want. That was the whole idea of devolution. It was not to create different countries within a country, no. It was to allow local people to have their own power. Now, I know for sure, because I was involved in the negotiations, that Zanubiev did not, did not like 
devolution at all. In fact, one of the reasons why the constitution making process could have broken down was because of ZANU-PF's refusal to agree to the point of devolution. They preferred decentralization, which is a very mild way of giving away power. It simply means the central government retains all the powers. I mean, how do you have a system in which even a town council in Binga or in Victoria Falls, if it wants to buy tissues, it has to go to procurement from central government in Harare. It yeah. doesn't make sense, you yeah. see. So uh, we wanted these things to be done locally. We wanted uh, the government to loosen its tight control on town councils, on city councils. Mm -hmm. But you know, ZANU-PF didn't like to give up control of city councils because uh, the opposition MDC uh, has won political power in these cities for many years, since uh, 2000. Yeah. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, the power of the MDC, contrary to what many people think, it's symbolic. <laughs> he doesn't have any power at all because power, even to, for a budget for the city of Harare, it has to be approved by central government. To appoint a town clerk who is the senior civil servant, like the prime minister of a, of a city council, um, you have to get authority from the central government. There is so much more mm. that the city councils cannot even do without the say so. We saw the demolition that were taking place in the last uh, four weeks after the lockdown, and people blame the city councils. Now, the city councils don't have the power to do that. That is conducted, that is a decision of central government. Right. So there's so much more, you know, that central government wants to keep control of. Mm. Uh, because it has to control the political economy of the local community. Yeah. Uh, and and so, so, so the failure to implement things that, like devolution for me has been a, a huge, huge letdown. Things that should have been done. Mm. What and, can be done? Okay. No, no, and just one point that's of interest to, I, I think a lot of people is around uh, dual citizenship. What's the... Because I think I, my understanding is that the 2013 constitution allows for it. Um, is, is that the case? Does the current government recognize dual citizenship? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so dual citizenship uh, is one of the, my uh, proud moments <laughs> of the constitution making process. Because you see, I was there, but I was also someone who was also with a leg in the diaspora. So I understood the challenges that were being faced by people in the diaspora. And I had written a lot about your citizenship at the time. And thankfully, mm. the two MDC parties at the time, the one led by Changirai and the other one led by Professor Washman Mule, um, were in favor of your citizenship. zanu PF was not enamored with this idea. <laughs> they didn't like it at all. They are the ones who had changed the law previously. So it was very tough to convince them. Uh, some of them eventually saw sense. They acted out of self-interest because they realized, yeah, we say to them, your children and your grandchildren, they are also in the diaspora. <laughs> Do you want them to lose their identity as Zimbabwe simply because you hold on to a very rigid law uh, mm -hmm. that you have been applying? So eventually there was a, a coming uh, together of ideas. So I have no doubt whatsoever. It has always been, for me, one of the great uh, achievements of the Constitution to allow dual citizenship. Now, it is allowed, and the courts have made pronouncements to this effect. Mm. The first case, in fact, was brought in 2013, just before the elections, by Mutumwa Mawere. Uh, she was represented by, uh, by the way, by my, my friend and uh, advocate, Fadai Mahere. She was the lawyer who acted uh, for, for him in that case. So that, that is the first precedent where the Constitutional Court agreed that dual citizenship for citizens by birth is uh, permitted. So there are many other cases which have come through the, the courts. Now, it's unfortunate that people have to go to court for this when the Constitution is very clear. In my opinion, the uh, government simply has to implement this make it clear in the statutes uh, and, and 
as far as I'm concerned, the fact that the constitution allows it, it, it invalidates all the other existing prohibitions that are there because that is what the law says. So my message to those in the diaspora mm. unequivocally is that the constitution allows for dual citizenship for citizens by birth. And it is important for you to get the documentation. You need your birth certificate. You need to get your passport. Then, of course, when you travel, you are able to assert your right using your Zimbabwean passport so that you don't have to be treated as a foreigner when you get into the country. Mm -hmm. Do you know if children of the diaspora can claim Zimbabwean citizenship? If mm -hmm. perhaps one parent is Zimbabwean and another is not, can, can your child... Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I would say that uh, one of the interesting definitions, uh, one of the interesting things that we put in the Constitution, because remember I said there was a lot of resistance to mm -hmm. dual citizenship. So the compromise that was put in place or the compromise that the suggestion that was coming from Zanupia was, oh, well, those who are born outside the country uh, should should not be able to to enjoy dual citizenship. Yeah. Right. Now uh, the way that we got around this mm. was to change the definition of what is meant by a citizen by birth. Now in the past you could only be a citizen by birth if you were born in Zimbabwe, right? Physically mm -hmm. born in Zimbabwe. If you were born outside the country, then uh, you would have to claim citizenship by descent. Yes. Um, now, uh, the way we define citizenship by birth under the current constitution is that you can be a citizen by birth even if you are born outside the country, but to one of the parents who is a Zimbabwean and who can also claim a residence in Zimbabwe. You can say I'm ordinarily resident in Zimbabwe. So in my opinion, I think that it's a clause that is flexible enough to mm. allow a lot of the young children who are born uh, outside Zimbabwe to mm. Zimbabwean parents. Zimbabwean parents only have to assert uh, uh, their Zimbabweanness and right. make a claim as to their residence, that they're residents of Zimbabwe. Mm. Mm. Okay, that, that, that's a helpful clarification. Um, and just staying with the, the diaspora, um, uh, we had a conversation with Advocate Fadzai here about the diaspora vote. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to get your take on that. We know that remit, um, diaspora remittances, you know, have kept Zimbabwe afloat. Mm -hmm. um, they've contributed a lot to the economy, um, but we, we, we do not have the ability to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the criticism that the diaspora has had is, you know, we're armchair critics, um, you know, we're just talking online. Um, and, but I personally feel that the diaspora vote is, is, is a key incentive that you can give people outside of Zimbabwe to feel part of the process. Um, so just a question from, just a question on that, on the diaspora vote, what is the way forward? How can we actually get to a place where the diaspora is able to take part in the vote? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. You know, this has been a contentious issue for for many years, mm. um, and and you know, people have given the different reasons why the diaspora should be allowed to vote, and uh, people talk about the remittances that you know uh, people uh, pay to 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 Zimbabwe. Uh, I should point out very clearly that uh, the notion that people in the diaspora are not involved in Zimbabwe, I think it's, it's a lot of nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and not just because I'm, I'm in the diaspora myself, but you know, I've been home, so I understand uh, both worlds. I mm -hmm. think that uh, the worst thing that could happen to a country is that its children, those who leave, forget about it. I think that would be truly sad. Mm -hmm. So I think that what should happen is that more and more should be done to realign the interests of Zimbabweans who are outside and Zimbabweans who are inside and their countries. 
mm. uh, they don't uh, send remittances because they're buying the vote mm. uh, or that or because they're buying uh, loyalty or buying acceptance. No, they do it because it is the right thing to do. Mm. And in doing the right thing, they are also making important contributions through the taxes uh, that they pay through those mm. transactions. So I, I think that... Uh, people can make some flippant remarks dismissing the diaspora. It's unfortunate, but it happens. You get idiots uh, who have uh, uh, very myopic views of how situations are. In many other countries, people, countries value their diaspora and do everything to ensure that they can harness the capacity of the diaspora. But that said, for me, I don't like to anchor the right to vote on remittances, because then it suggests that those who cannot remit or those who are not of economic capacity should be excluded. Or that at such point that the diaspora stops sending money to Zimbabwe, then they should not have the right to vote. I think that the right to vote is a right that is inherent, is a right that you have because you are Zimbabwean. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I think that as long as you are included in that political community, you should have the right to vote. At the moment, Zimbabweans in the diaspora are excluded from the political community because they are not allowed to vote, which is an unfortunate situation. But as I say, that a progressive government, mm -hmm. which wants to harness the full capacity and potential of the diaspora, should try as much as possible to have policies that are more inclusive of the diaspora rather than policies that are exclusionary. So I would urge a future progressive government to take a very long and hard look at the issue of voting and to do like other countries in the region, including South Africa, even Mozambique, you know, our neighbor, who allow, you know, voting by their citizens. If you can allow them dual citizenship, then surely you can also allow them the right to participate in the political affairs of the country. Yeah. Now, what can be done? Um, I think that there is need for a push. For me, one of the great weaknesses is the great weakness of the diaspora itself. Mm -hmm. And I should uh, point this out because I have been involved in the past in efforts to get the diaspora together. We used to have a platform about 10 or 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we did quite some fantastic work. Uh, I was just a figurehead, but I had some fantastic people. Some mm -hmm. of them have gone on to do great things in their individual capacities. Uh, but these are people who were really committed. They did a lot. We even had a conference in London where we brought government ministers to, to London and uh, we had an investment conference. It was fantastic. I think that some of the listeners might remember they may have been attendees at that conference which we held in London. Yeah. Now, the problem that I've always seen in the diaspora is that we are also a very selfish people. So if it's something that interferes with my ability to go to a shift, uh, then I'm not going to do it. If it's something that interferes with my ability to go to a religious gathering, uh, then I'm not going to do it. If it's something you know, that is in London uh, or in Birmingham, I, I'm not going to do it. I think that uh, our mentality has to change. If you want the diaspora to be taken seriously, if you want the diaspora to be included and to show that it is a force in the, in the political community, the diaspora itself has to get organized. And getting organized means that it has to plan, it has to do things. I see a lot of people getting together for religious causes. That's wonderful, that's fantastic. If people could show the same commitment to getting together to their cause as the diaspora and for Zimbabwe, I think that we would achieve a lot. Unfortunately, we only see a few people taking an active interest in this thing. Even then, you know, when we were doing the constitution, I came here with that group, we produced a paper which we called the diaspora a position on your citizenship. Mm -hmm. So we presented it as the position of the diaspora. But you know what? We had a handful of people 
who were getting involved and participating. The rest of the people were simply saying, you guys, you should get us your citizenship. But they were doing so from their homes. They're not interested in coming to participate. But if you have a, a goch goch or a bride, there will be a lot of Zimbabweans. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I think you make a good point. Um, I think the only point that I would make is I, I, I do think we are on a journey um, mm. as the Zimbabwean diaspora. We're, we're, we're relatively a new migrant group. Mm. And if you think 10, 12 years back, yeah. uh, of course, people were worried about their economic situations. Um, I think what I would say is probably you will find that moving forward, people have, mm. you know, more discretionary income, people have more time, people are more settled. Mm. And I think that's why we're seeing even online, there's a lot more engagement, increasing engagement from the diaspora because one, you know, we have the time, we have the capacity, mm. we've got the bandwidth to mm. think about those political mm. issues. Mm. Um, and secondly, you know, we're, we're living in Brexit, um, in, in, you know, this right wing Western yeah. world, yeah. which yeah. makes it very difficult to be a, a, a migrant. So, you no, know, that, 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 that's a good challenge <laughs> that I will. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, I hope so. Yes, indeed. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then, um, so um, just just moving on. So this weekend, I think this week is a year since the passing of Dumiso Dabengwa. Um, you talked about the struggle within a struggle when you're talking about Zanu and Zanla. Um, and I just thought about him as, you know, one of the... Um, our liberation heroes and I just wanted to and I know you wrote an article about him um just wanted to get your reflections on the man who mm -hmm. was um mm -hmm. a year mm -hmm. off from his passing and then perhaps we can then talk about how we've got to this binary politics where we only have ZANU and one main opposition yeah mm -hmm. yeah uh well um you know first of all I I I have a, a lot of respect for uh, Ubaba Dumiso Davenko. Mm. Uh, he, he was a man of uh, very few words, uh, very calm, very dignified. You know, he was one of those characters who, if you met him, he didn't have to say anything. Uh, I think that you felt the weight of his character. Um, I would have loved to have known him more and to have sat down and discussed with him more because I think that uh, he had a lot to give. I think he was a man of great wisdom. Uh, what, what humbled me uh, was ironically his humility um, in, in that he, he, for all the great things that he had done, you know, as a young man, in the liberation struggle uh, and, and as a senior politician, um, you know, as an elder statesman, he remained very humble. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always tell this anecdote um, about him, uh, which is a bittersweet one, but it, it has to be told because it, it told me the kind of man that he was. I was a young lawyer in Harare, uh, in about 1998, I was working for a, a firm in Harare. And um, he, he was uh, the minister of home affairs. So he wasn't far away from actually the offices where we were. Mm. And uh, a company that he was involved in had gone into debt with one of my clients. Right. And uh, so we wrote a, a letter to this company uh, uh, taking legal action. And um, when the letter was received, I received a phone call. And so my secretary says to me, you know how it was in Zimbabwe at the time. I don't know how businesses work now, but you know, uh, telephone calls would go to a secretary. I was a young lawyer, but I had a secretary <laughs> to myself. And so my secretary would pick the calls and then my secretary would then, you know, it was like a filtering method. So she said to me, uh, I've got Minister Davenko on the phone. And yeah, I, I almost froze. I said, what's going on here? But of course, I remembered that uh, the company that we, we had written a letter to was associated with the minister. Yeah. 
So I braced myself uh, for a thorough uh, uh, verbal hiding from, <laughs> from the minister. Mm. And what I got instead uh, was a man who was very respectful, you know, Mr. Magaisa. He was very soft-spoken, Mr. Magaisa, and he was very apologetic. And um, he said that he wanted to solve this as, as soon as possible. So I said, uh, not a problem. Uh, I actually offered that I could come over and then we could make arrangements. Mm. So he says, no, 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 no. Uh, I am going to come. <laughs> and for sure, you know, he came uh, with his aides to our office. Mm. And, uh, and, and so he came through and we had a, a, a discussion, we had a chat. And that was the end of it. And uh, it, was, it was fascinating because he is a guy who was in charge of home affairs. Mm. You know, he was in charge of the police. He was in charge of, you know, the coercive apparatus of the state. And I was, we had had encounters at university when I was a student, uh, when we were throwing stones, of course, as during the demonstration. <laughs> um, so my image of uh, Minister Tabengwa was that, you know, he's a ZANU-PF minister, menacing. Uh, these guys are cruel. Mm. But uh, he was a very different character altogether. He did not even use his position to uh, threaten me or to make me feel small. If anything, he made me feel very big, you know, as <laughs> small as I was. And, and so that was a very important moment for me. And later on, of course, we engaged and interacted as I was working with uh, Prime Minister Morgan Changirai. And it was always good. Uh, he would read my articles and I would uh, get feedback from people around him. Say Zubaba says continue, you're yeah, doing the right thing. And that was nice always to hear that uh, he, was, he was in touch. He is a man who suffered greatly uh, at the start of independence when everybody else was euphoric and happy with independence. Uh, Ubaba Dawengo was in, in, uh, in, in prison uh, mm -hmm. together with uh, uh, General Lukak Masuku, who unfortunately uh, uh, lost his life at the hands of the ZANU-PF regime. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he suffered a lot, um, but he came out of it and he, he did the best he could. I think that uh, there were a few difficult moments, of course, uh, during the time as a minister where he could have done things in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I reconcile myself to the fact that we all make uh, mistakes in our lifetimes. He corrected them, he left, and uh, he tried uh, his best to do the right thing uh, towards the end of his life. And I think that uh, he deserves a, a huge amount of respect, if anything, for the sacrifices uh, that he made. Uh, sorry, I could go on and on. Uh, no, 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 thank talking, you. That's talking about him, but he's a man that uh, I have a lot of respect for. Yeah, and talk about and talk about uh, Ubabu Dawengwa. Um, and so I think about Zapu, and I think what he was trying to do in his later life, um, with sort of reinvigorating Zapu and you know some young people um, being interested in that. Um, I wanted to talk about, I guess, where we are in our politics. Um, a is there is there room for a third party, another option outside of ZANU PF and MDC? And you know, how, how did we get where, where we are now, where those are the only options? How, how did we get where we are? Yeah, very interesting, very fascinating question. You know, in the 1980s, uh, we had the various parties. We had the uh, former Rhodesian Front. It was now called the Republican Front, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, at some point it moved into the Conservative Alliance. I can't remember exactly the identities, but this was a party which was representing, you could say, the white community emerging uh, into independence or out of the colonial period. Mm -hmm. There was a view that, uh, you know, it was necessary to give comfort and protection to the white community, which was very much in the minority. And so there were constitutional clauses which uh, uh, pre pre uh, preserved uh, certain seats uh, for the white community and certain privileges. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you could say that we had a multi-party system which, uh, had, uh, which included 
uh, these interests. Um, ZAPU was the other major party. Uh, the UANC, which was led by Bishop Abiyo Mzorewa, really lost out because they only won three seats in 1980. Mm. And ZANU-PF was the ruling party. But I think over the, the years, we ended up with a, really a binary situation where, the, where you were either ZANU-PF or, or ZAPU. Uh, but I think that binary excluded a lot of people who were in between. So you can imagine those of the former uh, Republican Front or Conservative Alliance, where did they go? Uh, those of the UANC, where did they go? Zanundonga, uh, there were many other parties which, you know, so, so there was a binary which was presented, but that binary was not in itself a fully uh, representative of the nation. Mm. Uh, in any event, in the 1990s, we had a new party which tried to come up as a challenge because in 1987, ZANU, PF, and PF ZAPU had become one party. Yeah. So that old binary was gone. And we were heading towards the one party state. We had Zoom, Zimbabwe Unity Movement, which came with uh, uh, Chakere, who had left ZANU PF, who had been expelled from ZANU PF. And uh, then we also had the Forum Party, which was uh, led by a former Chief Justice, uh, Enoch Dumuchena. Uh, it was really a group of elites uh, who thought that there was a need for, you could call it the third way. So the idea of the third way, <laughs> if you talk about politics, political parties, it hasn't started now. It, is, it was always there. Mm. So we then, uh, uh, but they didn't make much headway because these parties, I mean, Zoom did pretty well for its time, but the Forum Party had many challenges. It mm. remained very much a more elitist outfit, which didn't connect with the people at the grassroots level. Uh, in 1999, the MDC e emerged, mm. and the MDC was a culmination, you could say, of all these efforts that had taken place before. But more importantly, it was a, a sort of a big river, which was fed by various small tributaries, which mm. included trade unions, uh, uh, civil society groups, the women's movement, the students' movement, uh, I think churches were also involved, human rights organizations. Uh, there was also an interest from the new, from the capitalist uh, groups, especially those who were feeling threatened. Mm. So you saw the white farmers who were uh, getting threatened, uh, and and of course some industrialists, they also begin to support a, a, a joining the opposition. So the opposition was really a a, a confluence of many uh, uh, tributaries, which were trying to find a new way. And I think that the MDC had great many opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think for young listeners, they may not remember, uh, but those old enough uh, people like me who were living through that moment. I think we have a, a bittersweet memory of the 2000, and, uh, 2000 referendum. We had a constitutional referendum in February 2000 and uh, an election in June 2000. Mm -hmm. And uh, the February referendum was on a constitution that President Mugabe had led through a commission that he had set up called the Constitutional Commission. Now, a lot of the opposition and civil society groups did not like this constitution. So they mobilized a vote against this constitution. And uh, ZANU-PF essentially lost <laughs> the referendum because it was their constitution. Now, it was a great moment for many people because this was literally the first time that Mugabe and Zanu PF had been defeated in an election. Mm -hmm. But it was also a bitter moment because many of us with hindsight now realize that this was the moment when Zanu PF woke up because Mugabe and Zanu PF would not have thought that they could lose. Mm. But all of a sudden, it became clear to them that they were in danger of losing, that they they did not have the support. And so 
they launched an audio violence from February 2000. And that's when the farm invasions increased and the violence increased. And of course, we ended up with uh, an election in June 2000, which was a very violent election. <coughs> and uh, so, yeah, uh, they were able to overturn the political sentiment simply because they had been woken up by the referendum. And so that's why some people say the referendum was a bittersweet moment. Sweet because it was a defeat of Mugabe and Zanu PF. Bitter because it gave them a wake up call. Otherwise, if the election had been held in February 2000, who knows what might have happened? Yeah. Um, so just so you talked about the the, the violence that um, happened after the re the referendum. Um, so talking thinking about recent history, what's your take on the military? The military's role, and um, and and the fact that some people have argued that the military is very much aligned to the government to ZANU PF. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way forward? You know, when the military, you know, is aligned to one political party. Well, um, I'll just complete the last bit, which is the, the binary. So, so, so the binary that we have now is that you are either MDC or you are ZANU-PF. But as I said again, just like the old binary, it's not fully representative because there are a lot of other people who are also in between, who are not captured within the MDC or ZANU-PF narrative. Mm -hmm. The problem is that these people don't seem to have a home. They are wandering in the wilderness, unsure where to go. So is there an opportunity for another political party to come in and take that role? Well, who knows? It depends if you have the right leaders who have the right philosophy and the right ability to mobilize these people. But it's not just about the people in between. It's about taking people from either one of the, the two dominant parties. Now, I think that's a Herculean task. And I've seen quite a few people with uh, lofty ambitions, hoping that they can do so. I think that it's, uh, it's very difficult. Mm. Um, it's very difficult. Now, as for the military, well, the military is, has always been an important part of the Zimbabwean political landscape. I think that we have uh, decided to ignore it uh, for many years. Uh, and I think that it wasn't until the 2000s uh, when the military began to uh, vocally assert itself mm -hmm. as a political player that people began to really see that the military was a, an important uh, player in our political in our political system mm -hmm. and their partisanship is is has been quite clear or at least the partisanship of the military elite in other words the leaders of the military i, I don't want to blame the entire military because it's a large organization mm -hmm. but i think that the elites uh, who share a liberation war history tend to have sympathies with uh, uh, ZANU-PF, and we have seen that in some instances, but it's not every one of them who is like that. So I think it's always important not to paint the entire institution with the same brush. I would say that one of the things that we tried to do when we were doing the constitution is we were fully conscious of the politicization of state institutions. And it, it's not just the military, I've already spoken about the courts, for example, the judiciary, but we can speak about even parastatals, state-owned enterprises. We can uh, talk about the, uh, the, the police. We can talk about uh, other uh, parts of the civil service, which uh, have been highly politicized uh, by ZANU-PF because ZANU-PF has conflated the party and the state. Mm -hmm. So this, this problem, uh, this contamination, has also not spared the, the military. And during the constitution making process, if you read it carefully, we have a section in every part that deals with an institution that says that we should have political non-partisanship, that you should not put, support political parties. We put in those clauses because we were conscious mm -hmm. of the problem of politicization of institutions. Now, have these uh, clauses been implemented? Well, uh, I think it's disappointing when you see 
senior military and security figures attending uh, political party events, such as, for example, the Zanu PF conference uh, mm -hmm. in their uniform. Uh, I think that, uh, that that is a sad circumstance, which, uh, which doesn't augur very well with the intent and purpose and the spirit of the constitution. Even if they go there in their civilian clothes, it's still the same thing. You expect uh, people in that office to have more respect for their office. And I think having more respect for their office means refusing to be drawn into the petty uh, politics of the day, party politics. Mm. And I think that is a, a, a sad situation. So uh, we see whenever there is an intervention, the military or the uh, security uh, sector tends to come in with a very heavy hand. Now, others might say, well, this happens also in countries where there is no conflation between the party and the state. It's true. But I think that uh, if Zimbabwe's democracy is to progress, we are going to have to have a serious uh, cleaning operation, you know, a, a, a disinfection of all state institutions. And mm -hmm. that includes institutions such as the military, such as the judiciary, uh, institutions which are supposed to be the ones to guard the people against the excesses of politicians. I mm -hmm. think that they should take their role seriously. Now, this may be a generational thing. I think that uh, until, until the generation that is so intimately connected to the political generation of the liberation struggle uh, is no longer in control, we might continue to have these challenges. Now, that seems to be very pessimistic and perhaps depressing, uh, but it's the reality of our situation. Unless, of course, people are prepared to confront the system head on and say that uh, enough is enough. We cannot accept this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been very, very interesting <laughs> talking to you, getting your take um, on all the headlines and some of the historic uh, things that, um, you know, that we've seen and, and but never delved into. I know for myself anyway. Um, just to close, I wanted to uh, just turn to uh, Alex, the man, <laughs> just ask a little, um, just make it a bit lighter. Um, I'm interested in knowing um, with the Big Saturday Read, mm -hmm. how long does it take you to write an article? What's the process? Mm -hmm. uh, when do you start thinking about something to write and how long does it take you until you hit that publish button? <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I think one day we're going to have a podcast just on the BSR. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and we talk about the whole process because I get so many questions from people. Um, but I will say, uh, as much as my voice can allow, yes. um, the, the BSR, uh, you know, I've been writing for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it wasn't called the BSR at the time. I used to write. My friend um, Dudus Matut, okay. uh, he used to run uh, newzimbabwe.com. Yes. And uh, one day he asked me, Chief, Chief, can you write something? Mm -hmm. And then I wrote something. I was still in Nottingham at the time, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a piece. And then uh, we started writing more and more, more and more. And so uh, Alex Magaisa and newsmember.com became inseparable. <laughs> and I, I think a lot of our listeners might remember those days. So we used to write and comment a lot as much as we are doing now. But it was random. You know, it wasn't. It could happen on a Tuesday, it could be on a Friday. Uh, so it went on for many years. And then, of course, I went to Zimbabwe to work with uh, the constitution making process and then with Morgan. Uh, and then I came back. Uh, I always want to acknowledge people who have made contributions in my journey. Mm -hmm. Now, I used to be in a group with uh, one of the friends who I had there was a Chofamba, uh, Stole. Uh, is, is also as loud as me sometimes on politics. Uh, so he said to me, because he used to be an editor uh, of a newspaper in Zimbabwe. So he said, Alex, why don't you do one sort of flagship uh, uh, article uh, per week? So you don't have to write every, every, every time that you think you have an idea, but you can write something just once, something that people can look forward to. And I have to say, it was probably one of the best ideas I ever had from someone. Uh, 
you know, because I then say, actually, that works. And then another member of the group, I can't remember who, says, you give it a catchy title. So I thought, well, um, let me think of a, a catchy title. So I think I called it the Long Saturday Read. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't seem right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, then, I then said, I'll call it the Big Saturday Read. Mm -hmm. uh, this name was conceived uh, during a, a drinking session. Uh, mm -hmm. We were having a drink. So I said, I'm going to call it the Big Saturday Read. Well, big, not because, not because it is not humble. <laughs> no, but big because it's going to be a very long article. You see, that was the idea. Yeah. Just in case some people think uh, we call it the Big Saturday Read because of its content. No, it's called the Big Saturday Read because of its length. Because yeah. usually it goes on for like 5,000 words, <laughs> you know, it's very long. So it's supposed to be big in that regard. Yeah. But maybe some people think it's big in content as well, which is, which is fine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so how long does it take me? Um, writing is something that I enjoy doing. So sometimes I can be on a train. Uh, I can just sit on my iPhone and I start writing in mm -hmm. my notes. And before long, I realize that I've written an article. Mm -hmm. And then, so I usually start off with a very uh, rough draft of ideas. It's like a stream of consciousness, you know, mm -hmm. things just come through and I just write them down. And then um, I then sit back maybe after a day or two. And then I say to myself, let me read it again. When I read it again, I say, oh, this is rubbish. Uh, and uh, the idea is still there, but I say, hmm, I don't think I would love to read this. So I then start, start doing it again. Um, I, I, you know, I love metaphors. So for me, the metaphor of the BSR is like a carpenter <laughs> who goes out into the wood and, you know, uh, cuts a piece of wood and you start working on it. You start working on it. You don't finish it in one day. Mm. You don't finish it in one go. Mm. The, the finished product that people see in the end is a product of a, a lot of work, a lot of hours uh, that are put into it, but also a lot of very good people. Uh, I should mention, and um, uh, one of my very great assistants who just uh, came out of the blues as a godsend. <laughs> um, I think you know my friend, well, your friend Will. So Will wrote to me, uh, and I had been written to by many people, but something struck me about Will. Uh, I think it was a very genuine uh, desire, and the fact that she was someone who would not normally take an interest in politics, I thought, at the time. And she said to me, you know, I like this and I would like to help. Well, mm -hmm. What can I do, you know, in uh, editing? So. So I said, you know, I could give this to you and then you can read it before everybody else and you give me your thoughts, you know, yeah. and maybe pick out some corrections and so forth. So, so she became my uh, de facto editor yeah. and it was good because she was in America. So I could write, I could finish writing at six in the evening and it would be, I think, five hours behind uh, two o'clock or one o'clock there. And then she would have time. She would actually take time out of her work. Yeah. She would read through it, and they are very long, as you know, and she would read through it, and she would uh, uh, make some corrections. And I think over time, she also developed the confidence uh, to even comment and give suggestions, which yeah. is what she does now, which is brilliant. I like it. Um, I, I should mention, I should mention, I think I should mention this, because I want people to know why it matters to have someone who looks through your work and gives you a different view. Mm -hmm. A few weeks ago, I wrote an article which was uh, about the MDC politics. And I used a very common metaphor, a common word. And when I used it, it didn't mean much to me because it was just a word. So I said, I said something like, uh, that was long before uh, Dr. Kupe jumped into bed with Zanu PF, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's a common phrase, isn't it? Yeah. It's a common term. And for me, I, I wrote it. It didn't mean anything. Mm. But um, when Will uh, read the paper, her suggestion was, uh, maybe you might want to look at, at this again because some people might see it differently given, given the way that people use very crude language and metaphor, 
you know, um, sort of the image that they're painting of, of uh, women. Yeah. And she knows that I'm very uh, conscious about uh, gender uh, issues and, and so forth. And of course, that metaphor might not have had that meaning, but it might have been seen that way. And I was so grateful for that because then I had to change it to, to say something else. Yes. Now, this is an example. I use it because it tells the reader my own vulnerabilities, mm. my own weaknesses, even though they might think I'm a great writer. Mm. Uh, but it also tells them the importance of having someone uh, to, to look at your work because they will show you things that you might not even have imagined, that you might not even have thought of. Yeah. And so, so yeah, I'm, I'm ever so grateful. Uh, I have also another uh, uh, second person now who helps me. Okay. I'll just call him Tino. Um, he's, uh, he, he also helps me with editing. Uh, again, came through a uh, Twitter, mm, comma, what can I do to help? Yeah. And so I use them, both of them. They, they, uh, they, they help me a lot in what we do. And you know, what we are doing is we don't get any pay. You see, we don't have any adverts <laughs> on our website because yeah. it's not about commercial. It's just about ideas. Mm. Um, but uh, hopefully one day we will try to transform it uh, so that we can begin to compensate these people for what they do. There is also, of course, another young man whom I'll just call Dylan, mm -hmm. who set up the website and he helps us with technical issues. Right. These people are just doing things for free. We all do it for free. But mm -hmm. uh, maybe one day readers out there will find time to appreciate us. So we will call for their help to see yeah. how they can help uh, the people who are helping us to produce this thing. And if anyone is listening and, and they think they may be able, they may be of help, um, are you open to them reaching out? Oh, absolutely, them? absolutely. You know, they can reach out. I've, I've, I've already got a few people who have reached out uh, who want to help us with the website and uh, we will see uh, how we can, you know, I just said I get so busy, there's so much to do, uh, but I'll get around to it now that we've got the lockdown. I would like to use their potential uh, to do that. But yeah, you know, anybody who thinks that they can help us uh, for the code that we have, they can always get a hold of me on Twitter. My yeah. Twitter uh, handle, uh, Wamakaisa, you can tell them at the end. Yeah. Uh, but they can also email me at uh, Wamakaisa at me dot com which is w a m a g a i s a at m e dot com okay and i'll share that yeah, um, sure. as well um just last two questions um mm -hmm. how do you unwind you know a <laughs> highly visible person and i'm sure your mentions on facebook twitter are always <laughs> um quite overwhelming uh, what do you do to to you know just unwind and yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so thank you. You know, uh, my friends or people who know me will tell you, and now, now you know me. You know, we've met a few times. Mm -hmm. Who tell you that I'm just an ordinary guy? I, you know, I'm I am a Tawanda because Tawanda is my my name. You see, uh, that's who I am. I'm, I'm. You know, there are so many people who, even if I reply to them, they say, "Wow, you have replied to me," and I say, <laughs> well, "Why?" You know. It's, I, there's nothing special. So uh, I would like to say to other people, they're young and old, that the most important thing is not to take yourself too seriously. And uh, I should also point out that, because I think it's important in the age of social media, mm. there are many very cruel people out there who say very bad things and who are very nasty. Uh, I've learned to block it out uh, if you take yourself too seriously, you will be hurt. Uh, I don't. You know, they think, you know, people might say nasty things and think it will hurt Alex. It, it never does. It, does. it doesn't hurt me at all. In fact, I just love it off. My response, as many Twitter users have learned, perhaps, is that I simply respond with a joke or with a piece of humor, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I've learned from... My hosts here, they like to respond in a very interesting way. And I think <laughs> I've learned to respond in the same way. Yeah. So never take yourself too seriously. So yeah, unwinding for me, I just do the normal things. You know, I, I like to, to read uh, light stuff. I watch a lot of movies. 
uh, and when I watch movies, I've got a pen. <laughs> and I, because I, because I because I pick some lines, you see, you know. I think if you if you, if you followed uh, when we when we were watching the Game of Thrones, I used to have lots of quotations, you know, ah. from uh, from Tyrion and others, you know. Because for me, a, a book, a newspaper, a, a song, it's not just a song. There's something there. There's content. There's what, what are they saying and why are they saying it? So even songs, I write lyrics. I write them down. And now we are we are we are lucky with Google. You can always Google the lyrics. Uh, but I like to be on a journey of discovery. So I unwind by doing all those things, the very artsy things, mm. uh, which I think I would have done if I had not become a lawyer. I think I would have just been been. I'm more of a creative person, you know. So using my mind to create things and yeah. And I take walks. I live in a, I live in a, in a village. Uh, so we have lots of wooded areas around us. There is also uh, the sea, which is very close by. At a place called Wistabo. I'm sure you see me posting a lot of pictures by the the sea, the beach. I do that because I love the sea. I, the sea is very humbling. You know, the woods are very humbling. I love nature, and uh, my dream when I go back to Zimbabwe, as I will eventually do, is to have my home in a very, you know, wooded area, somewhere uh, far away from, from the crowds. And yeah. I just enjoy it. Yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> no, that's good. That's yeah. good. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Um, and no any, is, is there anything that you wanted to say in closing? Well, um, I, I thank you so much for, for this conversation. Um, there's so much to talk about. There's yeah. so much to engage. Um, you know, people, people should remain committed to Zimbabwe. I know that people sometimes have the feeling that they should give up. I don't think that we should give up. I think that uh, we should continue. We have had some challenges for many years. We are a nation that is hurting. Uh, but I think that the healing process is a process that involves us, uh, the people. Um, I, I would like people to, you know, continue to 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 hope and to act and to organize and to be involved, and um, you know, continue to love one another. And as I said, be yourself. Don't be, don't try to be anybody else. And and most importantly, have respect for other people. And, you know, you, you will be good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you so much. You're, you're most welcome. Most welcome. Thank you. Thank you.